Uh, today we're going to be playing some slower time control games and trying to make our way up to 2350. 2350 is the magic number that's used to determine whether or not you are a Lee Chess Master at classical time controls. So I'm just going to keep playing um, playing this slower time control and see how well I do at it. I think uh, given enough time and effort I could very well get the Lee Chess Master title at this time control but it would take considerable time and effort to make it happen. Um, so we're just doing this today to see how close overall I am to such a goal or if in fact I am at a level where it's already in my grasp. It's a bit crazy that my opponent's playing so quickly. Note that he can't follow up with a3 because then I take uh, then he takes and I capture his rook. So because of this pressure um, can't play a3 at the moment, um, and that in turn allows me to build pressure on this b-pawn, which arguably might move up to b5 here. Um, but I think this kind of setup where um, white's pawns are all pointing this way uh, gives up control of all the dark squares behind those pawns. So. I think that's a bit weakening for white to do. Um, not only does it give a control of the dark squares behind the pawns, but also in front of the pawns. Um, and that just seems like kind of a prison or a cage for those pieces on the queen side. But you could argue that this pawn on b5 does control c6 and a6, but all, mainly c6. So this extends white's control of the board um, beyond his half of the board. All right, so I have to decide, do I want to let this bishop out just yet? I think it's excellent for me to fragment this pawn structure and give my rook some more squares to deal with. It's very hard to turn down this opportunity to just take on b4 and then attack the bishop as soon as it's developed. Um, the only downside is that this also would free his bishop. That's going to happen anyway once he plays b5. So I'm taking here. Because that doesn't lose me anything that I wouldn't have already lost. In fact, I could play c5 here, and he can't take it because uh, his king's exposed. Yeah. Do I want my pawn on c5? Um, it is kind of a target there. It does support d4, but let's keep in mind d4 is also a target. Um, actually, c5 is tactically justified. Yeah, c5 wins material, so I should play it. Um, actually, no, it doesn't. Because uh, here my opponent needs to play bishop d2. And that's not where he intended to move the bishop originally, but this is a way to prevent tactics that win material for me, so this is what he needs to do to just stay in the game. And he's not choosing to stay in the game. He probably overlooked the sacrifice. That's too bad for him. It really is. So this is going to happen, um, or this was my plan, uh, for addressing bishop a3. 
And I thought this was forced, but it's not, because he could have done bishop d2 instead of bishop a3. Now, he's probably going to get some counterplay for the sacrificed material. Um, and there's... I can't stop the counterplay, per se, but... Um, or I can't stop it entirely. Alright, this raises a question. Which pawn is more valuable? Should I be holding on to my b-pawn? Or is it too greedy for me to do so? Removing the a-pawn really accelerates my opponent's development, um, but it also gives my queen a square to go to. Like, he should have continued queen c2 and then rook b1. That would have been a more methodical way to approach this, but that would also give me time to push my pawn to b6 and shore it up there. Um, which is maybe what I need to do anyhow. Maybe I need to do queen a7, push b6. Do I have time for that? So queen a7, let's say queen b3. Yeah, I don't have time to secure my b-pawn. Well, that's a weakness that I couldn't avoid. Um, I should strive to continue or complete my development anyway. Oh, here's an idea. Knight c6. So... Hmm. It raises the question about, could I hold on to both of these pawns through tactical means? Um, I think it's an endeavor worth trying. So this gets in the way of the bishop. Um, so I've cut off the bishop so it can only reach as far as the knight now. And sure, his rook controls all these squares, too, but um, he needs to find a specific target and build an attack on it. Now, one thing he could do, and I'm not sure about this, is knight to b3, which exerts influence on c5 here. And I think I'm going to counter that with knight d7, possibly followed by rook e8, e5, and bishop f8. I don't think I'm losing any of these pawns. And so I've just got two minor pieces for a rook. And I think all my pawns are secure. Because I'm going to do something like this, and this, and rook e8, and bishop f8. And then I'm also threatening to break through at some point by playing e4. Um, another point to note is that now that b7 is no longer hanging, this is well protected, and this is protected. Um, I'm able to set my sights on this pawn and win yet another pawn and extend my influence across his side of the board. Um, it's not easy, but I'm making progress. Alright, so the move is knight b3, and this is again something I recommended for him. And I was saying he's going to continue with trying to do this, um, but I could use knight d7 to protect that. I also mentioned I could just take his pawn on a2. Oh, but that loses my c-pawn. So first things first, let's not hang material. So let's defend this pawn. Um, and yeah, my look, position looks relatively sound. My queen's off sides, but so is my opponent's queen, so there's really nothing for me to be afraid of there. Okay, so queen d2 happened. Um, and this does protect the a-pawn. So I think I have to break in the center. Uh, or follow knight b4 at some point here, but um, I think e5 securing my center makes some sense. Um, 
How do I untie this knot of pieces that I've built up? Yeah, I do need to start... Um, give my rook somewhere meaningful to go. And so my rook makes sense behind the pawn. And the pawn, once moved, is no longer in the way of bishop f8 protecting this. So I think turn by turn my position is making a little bit more sense. Okay, we got h4. I'm not surprised, but it uh, doesn't make it sound. Um, I mean, what, is he going to push the pawn to h6? Is that the idea? If he wants to do that, okay. It's within his right to keep pushing the pawn. But I don't think the pawn's any more effective on h6 than it is on h2. Um, as long as there aren't any open files to operate on, this pushed pawn doesn't make a difference. Now, I could also move um, pawn to h5 to stop him from playing h5, but I didn't see any need to do that. Okay. So this queen supports the knight, and the knight attacks the pawn. I'm tempted to try to force the queen away. I could also just play knight b8 to protect my pawn. No, I can't. That would hang a knight. Um, yeah, so here we are with tactics to the rescue. We're attacking the queen and the queen's supporting the knight. And so once he takes there, I take here. And I think all my squares are secured. Um, I think I have time for this, too. It's a free pawn. That pawn would have been quite a nuisance if it actually had moved up the board. But as far back as it stood, it didn't really didn't do anything. Um, and then there's the knight on f8, means that there's no checkmate. Um, pretty standard theme. Okay, so if I can't lift my... if I can't develop my rook along the e file, maybe I can develop it across um, some other file. Yeah, so let's develop the rook. And by develop, I mean I'm going to just trade it on e2. So here we go, check. And we check here. And everything's covered. And make sure not to hang this pawn. And now I can just bring out my bishop and knight when I need to and slowly walk my way up the board. Okay, let's build some pressure here. Next, we're going to move here and trade queens, as promised. Uh, there it is. Yeah, 2350 is ambitious. There's no questioning that. But I don't think that makes it unreasonable. Um, it just means that it's going to take a little while. Although I've made it... Um, I forget what my highest classical rating has been thus far on this site. But I think 5-5 is just the right time control for me to try to do this. Um, 